I never dreamed I'd be staring down at a visual graphic of a person's chromosomes, a karyotype, and it would be my son's, Everett, my first child. For the layperson, a karyotype is a visual graphic of a person's chromosomes. Most of us have 46 chromosomes. Persons with trisomy 21 have 47 chromosomes because they have a third copy of the 21st chromosome. And that third copy affects every cell of their body. In mosaic Down syndrome, that third copy only affects some of the cells in that person's body. And with a person with translocation Down syndrome, that third copy attaches itself differently to different chromosomes. Down syndrome is interesting because it is a syndrome. It's not a disease, it's not a condition. You can't catch it. It's not diagnosable by symptoms. It's diagnosable by a collection of markers. Sometimes those markers are physical markers, external. Some they're, sometimes they're internal. The karyotype, that's the definitive marker. I'll never forget the day Everett was born. He was born five weeks early, which was quite a shock to us. He was also born with extra genetic material, which was quite a shock to us. Everett got a postnatal diagnosis, which means he was diagnosed after he was born based on his appearance. I'll never forget what my doctor said. She said, I think your son has Down syndrome. He has quite a few markers. I'm not entirely sure, but I think he has Down syndrome. I'm gonna order a karyotype, and the karyotype will tell us whether or not he has Down syndrome. And your pediatrician can give you more information. I've been wrong before, but I think he has Down syndrome. And then she hugged me, and she left and went and delivered more babies, I'm assuming. She was very compassionate. But when she left, the compassion left with her. And there I sat, stunned, with information that was going to change the course of my life. And in those precious moments, a nurse decided it was, it was time for her to tell me very abruptly, your baby has Downs. I've never seen this many markers and a baby not have Downs. Your baby has Downs. Your doctor is giving you false hope. He has Downs. And I'm telling you because I would want to know. If I could travel back in time, I would shout at the top of my lungs, well, I don't want to know. I just wanted to enjoy my new baby. I just wanted to enjoy being a new parent. But those moments were robbed from me with those callous words, your baby has Downs. And then she felt it was necessary to inform me, don't even try to breastfeed. Down's babies can't breastfeed. I, I wouldn't even try if I were you. Which is false. Babies with Down syndrome can't, they're like any other baby. Some babies breastfeed really well, some struggle with it. And then she decided to exclaim to my entire family that we chose the name Everett, that's my son's name, because we were saving a better name, our favorite name, for our next baby. Nice. Really hurtful, actually. And in the aftermath of all of this, this horrific diagnosis experience, at some point, I tried to wrap my head around everything, and big questions started forming. The first of which was, what reality is this? I didn't choose this reality. A reality where someone labels and limits my child moments after he's born, after he enters this world. Down's babies can't breastfeed. And better yet, how has this reality come to be? How are we talking about Down syndrome that would lead this person to believe that it's okay to say things like that? So I'm a researcher, and what we do as researchers is when we form big questions, we, we delve into the information, and that's what I did. I dove headfirst into every piece of information I could find about Down syndrome. I knew nothing about Down syndrome prior to this moment. So as I was researching and gathering information, uh, several themes surfaced, several. I've narrowed it down to, to four today. But I got quite a reality check by working through this information. Research theme one, I was lucky to walk out of the hospital with Everett that day. In the 1930s, the 1940s, 50s, I would have been encouraged to institutionalize him. That was common practice during that time because it was assumed Down's babies don't have higher order needs that can be met. They can't live up to their full potential. So let's push them into the hidden margins of society, institutions, and, and their basic needs will be met, but they can't infringe on the quality of life for their family members. And that was common practice at the time. Those were the assumptions driving what people thought about Down syndrome. And that saddened me to know that that was a part of, of Everett's history 
It saddened me. But I kept doing research and I uncovered some more information about Down syndrome. I discovered the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. It was formed in 1990. Um, it provides protection for individuals with disabilities from discrimination and ensures equal opportunity to a lot of resources, including our public school systems. I'm a child of the 80s. And so when I sat in elementary school classrooms, I didn't sit next to students who were differently abled. I didn't sit next to a student with Down syndrome. To my detriment, I wish I would have. I think it would have made me a better person. So I assumed this was going to be Everett's reality. He would be segregated into special education. There was special ed, gen ed, the two worlds did not meet. But that's not the case in today's day and age. It's called inclusion. A lot of school systems um, are providing special education services, but they're also pushing for kids with Down syndrome and other differently abled children to sit into these mainstream classrooms right next to their typically developing peers. And guess what? They're learning. They're learning to read. They're learning to write. They're learning math, how to socialize, how to communicate with other people. They're learning how to live in this world. And their typically developing peers, they're learning some very valuable lessons as well. So I was very happy to learn that things had changed um, and we now see kids of, of all walks of life sitting together side by side learning in a lot of our public education systems, a lot of our schools. However, there's this third research theme. As I was digging into information through discussion forums, that's another way one can gather information, I, I joined a lot of moms groups I, and, and these moms had children with Down syndrome who were my child's age. A lot of them were sharing stories very similar to mine. They had horrific diagnosis experiences where people were callous and insensitive when they conveyed that information to them, which troubled me. That's scary. A lot of them were also talking a lot about how the world was responding to their children with Down syndrome. Venting, stories where people, were, moms were venting about how they felt like their children were being labeled. Strangers were asking them very odd questions about their children. So while these advances are occurring in our school systems and in these other arenas of our lives, we're still being hit with these outdated questions and these terms, these words about our children. I remember standing in line at a department store. Everett was about three months old. I was buying him some new baby clothes on sale. I was having a normal moment as a parent. That's what I craved in those early days. I just wanted to feel like a normal parent. And Everett was sitting in his little stroller, playing with some toys. It was a really sweet moment. And it was interrupted when a complete stranger tapped me on the shoulder and I saw the look on her face. And I knew what that patronizing look meant. Something's coming and I don't know what. And she blatantly asked the question, so how high functioning do you think he's gonna be? Not, hi, nice to meet you, your baby's adorable. How high functioning do you think he's gonna be? And I'm not very good in moments like that. I didn't see that question coming. Um, so I responded as I oftentimes do off the cuff, question with a question, and I said, well, how high functioning are you? <laughs> kind of a rude question, so you might want to consider your own level of functioning as it relates to social etiquette, which is funny and appropriate, but I saw the look on her face. She was stunned, and I saw the people around me, and I, I realized that wasn't the best way to respond. What did I teach her about Down syndrome? Did I teach her how great my kid is? Did I teach her, you know, let's, let's ask these questions instead. Let's talk this way about Down syndrome instead. No, I taught her that I am an angry, tired, bitter mother of a child with a disability. And confession, sometimes I am a little bit tired. I never dreamed I'd be teaching the world about my child constantly. I thought I was gonna have a child and teach him about the world, but that's not the case. And it exhausts some of us moms. Research theme number four. These questions and these things that we're saying about Down syndrome, they're leading to certain actions that I don't think that we're aware of. There's this new invention called early prenatal testing. Everett got a postnatal diagnosis, but we are in the minority. Most people get a prenatal diagnosis in today's day and age. And a lot of parents, when they get a prenatal diagnosis for their child with Down syndrome, it stems from a blood test, early blood work, um, and, and one can determine whether or not um, the child a mom is carrying does or does not have Down syndrome. It's leading to some, um, some parents who are preparing ahead of time. They have time to think about it and process the information, but it's also leading to this decision to selectively terminate the pregnancy early on. 
Now, there's a lot of research in this area, but it's new research. Older streams, and by older, I mean 2010, 2011, so not very old. Older research demonstrates that roughly 72 to 90% of parents, when they get an early diagnosis of Down syndrome, they choose to terminate their pregnancies. Having said that, new research is available that demonstrates here in the United States that statistic is most likely much lower. It's really probably closer to 30%. And by talking about this other statistic over here, it normalizes that decision. So I want to be sure that I talk about both bodies of research today. But regardless, that's a life or death decision. Because of that squiggly little third copy of the 21st chromosome, how are we talking about Down syndrome that is leading people? What are the negative assumptions about Down syndrome that, that, are, that are leading people to make these decisions? I tell people all the time, Everett is really not that different than his brother who has 46 chromosomes. But that squiggly little third copy of the 21st chromosome, it's made all the difference in my life. It's changed me to the core. It's changed the way I've seen this, I see this world. Why someone would want to remove that from their lives, it baffles me. And it baffles a lot of other moms out there. I'm not the only one. So I vote, let's start talking about Down syndrome differently. It's not something we should label or limit or have negative assumptions about. It's something to celebrate. So social constructionism occurs as we talk. We use words to, to connect with one another, to create a system of shared meaning, and those words are symbolic of something bigger. They create a reality. The way we talk, the words we choose, and the way we interact with one another, that is our reality. So the question is, how are we socially constructing Down syndrome? What are the words we're using? I hear the word Downs a lot, and oftentimes it sounds like a label. I've heard Everett referred to as a Downs kid, a Downs baby, I was referred to as a Down's mom, thought that was strange. I don't have the karyotype to prove it, but I don't think I have Down syndrome. Um, Everett's been called a Down boy. It's a dog command, that's not how we talk about our fellow human beings. But we label and we limit, and I think what bothers me when I hear these terms used that way is it's almost always followed up with some sort of outdated assumption. Down's babies can't breastfeed. Down's babies are happy all the time, no and no. Babies with Down syndrome, Sometimes they breastfeed really well, sometimes they don't. I can assure you, they are not happy all of the time. That would make my life a lot easier, actually, if that were true, but it's not. And so how are we taught, what are we saying? How are we socially constructing Down syndrome? Um, so I'm not the only one who poses this question. There are a lot of moms out there, and we're trying to socially construct a new reality, socially construct new conversations about Down syndrome. We call ourselves rockin' moms because our kids rock a third copy of that 21st chromosome. And, you know, we rock as moms as well. Um, but we're trying to create these new conversations about Down syndrome because this is our reality. Um, we oftentimes rely on hashtags to do that. We're, we're kind of scattered across the globe. So we will um, create these hashtag movements to, again, talk about Down syndrome in more realistic ways. Uh, one of my favorites is hashtag life with DS. Uh, we did that on World Down Syndrome Day in 2015. We all created blog entries that chronicled an average day and, you know, raising a child with Down syndrome. And then we posted these blog entries um, and hashtagged it, you know, hashtag life with DS. And I read the responses that people provided on my own posts and the posts of others. And everyone kept saying, oh, wow, you know, it's just like, you're just like any other parent. Your, your, your day sounds like any other parent's day with a two-year-old. I'm like, yeah, it, it, that, that's right. It's just an average day. Our lives are not that different than your lives. Down syndrome isn't bad. It's something to celebrate. Uh, we also use, we use several hashtags, um, but hashtag the lucky few is a popular one. And oftentimes we portray photos of our children, you know, maybe sometimes crying, throwing a tantrum. We want to present a realistic picture. We want to create a, a next conversation about Down syndrome that's indicative of our reality, not this other reality that people see, keep wanting to impose on us. So we also sometimes post photos of our kids. They, they do have health concerns. That is most of the time part and parcel with Down syndrome. There are health issues related to having that squiggly little third copy of the 21st chromosome. Um, but Again, we want something uh, realistic, realistic conversations. Uh, you know, we're rocking it as moms, no doubt, but it's easy for us to create these conversations because it's our kids. They're the ones that are rocking it.
They're doing amazing things. Uh, one of Everett's therapists once said to me, there is no better time to be born with Down syndrome. There are so many medical, therapeutic, educational advances in place. Uh, we're discovering now through research and intervention what our kids' true potential is. And it's amazing. They're accomplishing their dreams just like any of us in this room right now. Uh, Google entrepreneurs with Down syndrome. You'll find a host of individuals who own their own food trucks, snow shacks, restaurants, designer sock lines, clothing boutiques, you name it. They're going out there, they're taking the world by the horns and they're owning it. Um, Google famous people with Down syndrome. They're accomplishing things most of us in this room will probably never accomplish. Celebrities, reality stars, actors in major television series, fashion models walking the New York runways, professional athletes, orchestra conductors. These kids are amazing, and this, this is what we moms want to talk about. We don't want to answer questions about how high-functioning our child is or isn't. We just want to talk about how great they are. This is our reality. This is what we're trying to socially construct. These stories right here. So in conclusion, I argue we start using different language when talking about Down syndrome. Let's create a new narrative for Down syndrome. Maybe this graphic is right. Maybe we're the ones missing something. I wish everybody could wake up to the social media news feed that I wake up to. I get to see kids and adults with Down syndrome at every age and stage of the game living their lives to the very fullest. And I know you see these stories too, because a lot of you share them and you tag me in these stories, which is great. Um, but make sure when you're sharing these stories, you're sharing the ones that are realistic, that reflect some of the things that we talked about today. And maybe, maybe, just go out and invite a real live person with Down syndrome into your lives. I guarantee you that squiggly little third copy of the 21st chromosome will make all the difference in your life, just like it did mine. Thank you, and happy belated World Down Syndrome Day. Woo.